23rd chapter of Genesis. I'd like to read the first seven verses of that chapter, and we'll make a few points about that account. Genesis chapter 3, beginning there in verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Now, specifically regarding the tree here, we know from Genesis chapter 1 verse 30 and chapter 2 verse 9 that it was placed in the midst of the garden, as we just read in verse 3 of chapter 3. Think about that term, midst. It was in the middle of the Garden of Eden. Yet we find in verse 6 that Eve is looking at this truth or this fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent, the devil, doing what he does best, and that is tempting others persuaded her to see past what she already had and instead focus on what she lacked. You see, this tree was in the middle of the Garden of Eden. So in order to get to this particular tree, think about all the blessings and all the, the fruit and herb yielding trees that God had given them to sustain them physically that they passed by in order to get to this one tree. And when she saw it, she basically applied 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And we know what that passage is dealing with. It's dealing with temptation and how we are tempted. The only three avenues by which we're tempted, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We see that unfold in verse 6. It's good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and this fruit can make one wise. In baseball, if you remove from one of the bases, you're eligible to be tagged and be recognized as out. That hurts your team. That's the idea of temptation. Satan is trying to get us from our home base get us away from what we know from God and once we do give up that safety through our own lusts we're drawn away of our own lusts we allow sin to conceive and ultimately it brings forth death you see once they went past all those good trees that God permitted them to eat of and they went to the middle of the garden they overlooked everything that God had blessed them with and in that moment she focused on what she lacked. She wanted this wisdom. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was good for food. And when she ate, she sinned. She gave it to her husband and he sinned. As we say, that he jumped really both feet right into that situation. He should have done his part as head of not only the household, but head of the entire human race and said, Get thou behind me, Satan. But he shirked his duties as man and thus allowed his wife to be tempted of the devil and ultimately sinned. And they both sinned. 
I think oftentimes where we fall short as well is where we focus on things that we lack. They used to call it keeping up with the Joneses. I don't know if they do that anymore, but I don't know of any Joneses, but I know people are trying to keep up with them. It might be a, a nice vehicle, might be a nicer house, might be nicer clothes, could be anything. Well, I don't have whatever it is, and they do, and they start chasing after the whatever it is. The Bible calls that stuff. All that extra stuff. Yet when we, we do that, we forget about Matthew chapter 6. God supplies for his children. Because remember, Adam and Eve were God's children. God made them. God gave them roles. God gave them jobs in the garden to tend to it. And he provided for all their physical sustenance. As children of God, as Christians today, God does the same thing for us. It's not miraculous. It's providential. He cares for us through our, the fellow members of the church. He cares for us throughout the efforts that we supply for ourselves. You know, if, if I never look for a job, I'm not going to be able to supply for my family. I do have a job, but just to illustrate the point, if I decide to quit my job and I don't look for a job, I'm failing as a man and as a husband and a father. And I'm shirking my duty in providing for my household. But Jesus in that chapter promises our faithfulness, God will take care of us. The lilies, think about how pretty they are, especially now this time of the year we have all these flowers coming up, the blue bonnets, and all those rattlesnakes right along with them, the Indian paintbrushes, the sunflowers, all these different flowers are gorgeous. And it says even Solomon wasn't even arrayed like those. If God was able to supply the needs of Adam and Eve, don't you think he's able to supply our needs as his children, Christians today, members of the church? Absolutely he is. But Matthew 6, points out, Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. You think Eve did that whenever she looked upon this fruit? No, she was focusing on what she lacked. We too can fall snare to that. Pick any subject, it doesn't matter. But when we get off base, we decide that, you know, maybe I'm lacking in this area, and it's, might even be a good thing, but we twist it, we turn it, and it becomes second or first before God. That's when we fall short. Does that mean I have to seek God before my wife? Yes. Seek ye first. Yeah, but my children, seek ye first. The more I love God, the better I am able to love my wife my children, my neighbors, lost souls, members of the church, even myself. As I grow in my love for God and properly applying His principles found in Scripture, I'm able to love each of those groups as I ought to. I become better at it. And that's true of everyone. I once saw one time, it was a triangle talking about marriage. And you have each spouse at the bottom of the triangle, God at the top. And as one loved God more, ideally they love God more. But look at how that line draws closer to the spouses. When they love God more, eventually they're going to love each other more. Eve did not possess, at least in this moment, that love of God that she needed. Instead, she focused on what she lacked. And as a result, she was tempted, and she did, in fact, sin. That happens to everyone. We're all subject to this type of thing. We didn't inherit this sin, but we did. We were born into a sin-sick world. Temptation is all around us, and sometimes it's easy to just take of that fruit. It could be laziness, it could be ignorance, it could be outright rebellion against God. 
Now, as a member of the world, if you are not a Christian, obviously you wouldn't be. But have you think have you thought about becoming a Christian, becoming a child of God, being in a good relationship with your Creator? Because as a member of the world, you're ultimately a child of the devil. Jesus gave that label. That's not my own thinking. Why not put away the wickedness, obey the gospel, ultimately being baptized for the mission of your sins? Why not make that change today? Or as a child of God and you've allowed sin back into your life, maybe you focused on what you lack. Maybe it's another area. Either way, there's, if there's sin in your life, why not take care of it at this time? Either of these needs, if you have it, please make it known as together we stand and sing.